Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea Lauder, Communications Manager with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. We also have members from Alberta Pulse Growers and Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers with us online today, and I wanted to acknowledge Laura Schmidt and Rachel Peterson for their help organizing and promoting this webinar. Thank you. Welcome to this jointly hosted Pulse webinar. Today's webinar features research that's been funded through Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's AgriScience Clusters program. Before we get started, I wanted to mention today's webinar does qualify for CCA and CCSC credits, but you must watch the webinar live to receive credit. For those who attend the webinar, I will send an email afterwards requesting your numbers. You can respond to the email and send me your CCA and CCSC numbers. And if you have more than one person watching from one computer, please have someone verify those in attendance so we can include everyone's numbers. This webinar will be recorded and shared with APG, MPSG, and SPG to be posted to websites or shared on social media for future viewing for those unable to attend or for those who want to another look at what was addressed today. For today's webinar, all participants will be muted and we will be happy to take questions. To ask a question, please type it in the question box located in the GoToWebinar dashboard. For today's webinar, Dr. Tenuta has divided his talk into three sections and we can address questions after each section as well as at the end of the presentation. Today we have Dr. Mario Tenuta speaking to us from the Department of Soil Science at the University of Manitoba. He's a professor of applied soil ecology and his background includes a BSc in Botany and Physical Geography, an MSc in Soil Science, and a PhD in Plant Sciences with postdoctoral research in nematology. He leads the Soil Ecology Laboratory at the University of Manitoba, and this laboratory tackles applied questions to give farmers and industry solutions to increase profitability while improving soil and environmental health. Together with his many colleagues, the team has addressed many soil related issues, including improving nitrogen use efficiency for crops, mitigating mitigation of greenhouse ga gas emissions, documenting the benefits of 4R nutrient management practices, and um, field surveys of emerging soil borne diseases and nematode pests of crops. So, without any further ado, I'm going to turn things over to you, Dr. Tanuta. Great, thank you, Andrea. It's a pleasure to, to uh, join everybody today, especially on this great celebratory day of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers winning the Grey Cup and the parade downtown in Winnipeg. So I'm, I'm hoping not to keep everybody here for too many hours so that, it, that those from Manitoba can get to the parade. So let's launch into this, nematodes on the Canadian prairies. And what you see there is an example of a nematode that comes from soil that can uh, affect plants, but this is not a really nasty one, but it's a really gorgeous nematode. And um, we're gonna talk more about these critters and see what issues and aspects of nematodes we should be concerned about growing crops on the prairies. So I'm at the University of Manitoba. If you follow Twitter, or if you participate in Twitter, please join us uh, at Soil Ecology U Manitoba, or U Man on Twitter, and also on the internet uh, at uh, visit soilecology.ca just to learn more about uh, uh, my students and research staff and our activities. So let's launch into it. the, uh, oh, here we, there we go, what are nematodes? Now, People, first thing people ask me about these critters is, is it a nematode or a nematode? And I say it's okay, you can call it whatever you want, either, okay? It's like tomato, tomato type of thing, okay? So I, I usually say nematode. So what are nematodes? There are worms, but they're not earthworms, okay? They're not similar to earthworms. These are small, unsegmented worms and the ones that live in soil and plants or on, in and on plants are small. They're maximum uh, a couple of millimeters in length. You'd hardly see them with your eye, okay? And they're very usually thin, narrow, uh, so not very wide. Now, there are many kinds of nematodes out there in the world. 
And the longest or the biggest one is 8.5 meters and that lives as a parasite on blue whale in the oceans. Actually, it, it lives in the placenta of the blue whale. So the animal parasites can be quite large. Maybe your dog or cat has coughed up a bunch of worms. Those are nematodes. They're quite large. The ones that we're dealing with in soil and in plants are much smaller, okay? So it's not the same kind of looking critter, even though they are similar uh, in terms of um, organisms, okay? Now, nematodes, have to feed on other organisms, okay? They're not like plants, they don't grow their own food. So they need to feed on other nematodes, other soil organisms, or they can choose plants to feed on what we call being a herbivore, okay? And that's what really what we're talking about today is those kinds, okay? So different types of nematodes or species of nematodes feed on different food sources. Um, and it's these ones here that feed on plant roots, stems, bulbs, tubers, and leaves that we're most concerned about because of their effect in um, decreasing yield and quality of our tuber or grain crops, okay? Now there are other nematodes, that, some that can feed on bacteria, some that can feed on fungal hyphae and spores, algae in soil, protozoans in soil, and other critters in soil. Okay, so it's vast diversity of um, uh, nematodes in soil. And so just keep in mind the ones that feed on plants are just a portion of this much greater diversity of um, these unsegmented worms in soil, okay? Now, interestingly in soil, they actually live in the water in soil. So they live inside the pores that are filled with water when the, those that live on the surface of plants, they need water films on their surface, on the surface of the plants, okay? So they're gonna be thriving more under humid conditions um, in soil and in, um, uh, on plants, okay? Doesn't need to be saturated or super wet. We just, we just need, we need some water present, okay? Another cool thing about nematodes is that they're absolutely everywhere. Okay, you name it, they're there in the desert, in an agricultural field, in the prairies, agricultural field, somewhere in Ghana. Uh, they're just everywhere, okay? Uh, highest mountain tops, Antarctica, they're everywhere. So they're, it's pretty neat. They're very successful, group of organisms, actually. And the vast majority of nematodes are exceptionally good. They're exceptionally good for the soil. They're exceptionally good for plants, except there are some that are detrimental to plants because of their feeding damage that they cause. That's what we're going to kind of focus on today. So here's a life cycle of a nematode. It all starts with an egg. So this little capsule here is a, a nematode egg that has come out of a female and it'll be generally in soil, in the soil pores. The nematode actually develops within the egg. You can see it here, it's dividing. You can kind of see some cells here. And then we start seeing eventually inside the egg what looks like a worm or a nematode, okay? And it will uh, continue to develop within the egg. It actually even goes through what's referred to as a molting, or you want to call it a shedding. It actually sheds its skin its, or its, its exterior inside the egg. But then by the second time, it needs to go to a molt or shedding. It actually emerges from the egg. All right, here it is emerging here. And then now what we see is a worm in the soil. So this is now in the soil or on the surface of plants. And then they uh, continue to grow, they feed. In this case, if our plant feeding them, it's supposed to be feeding on plants. They Gain energy from the plant and nutrients, grow, get larger, they molt, shed, they do that a good uh, two times, and then eventually they shed one last time and then they turn into either a male or a female worm. Now there's tends to be way more females than males, okay? Males just biology, ecology, ecology, just don't need very many males. They're kind of useless, right? There's only one purpose for these things. And the females are really 
um, the dominant uh, numbers. And uh, after mating with the males, they will produce eggs and we have the whole cycle again, okay? So a common question I get as well, how many cycles can a nematode do in a year? Well, in our environment on the prairies, where we have um, a growing season that might be three to four months, and most crops are, are less, uh, you know, about three, three months, we're looking at about two generations or so, okay, of these life cycles, so two life cycles. So we can easily get a double or quadrupling of the, the population, okay? Now, uh, in terms of plant nematodes, there are broadly three categories that we can, we can uh, classify. We can have the endoparasitic nematodes, endo being inside, and it generally tend to be inside roots, okay? And here's some examples here. Here's a root system of corn affected by the stubby root nematode. You can see the damage is caused on the root. It's deformed the root. Here is well, this is banana, we're not gonna have that on the, on the prairies, but uh, let's go to, there's raspberry, rose with a dagger nematode causing damage and just really disforming the root system, not making it very effective. Here's a uh, dry bean with a sting nematode. Again, same sort of thing. It really affects the development of the root system. And with these endoparasites, we need, large numbers in soil and their effect is to stunt and um, uh, keep the growth of plants, uh, slow it down, and so we, we have a general dwarfing of the plant, not very vigorous. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a moment, okay? Now there's another type called the migratory nematodes and these ones go in and out of roots. Okay, so these ones here live on the outside of roots, these endos. Um, then we have, uh, sorry, oh, well, this is a typo there, it should be ectoparasite, the ecto being outside of the root. And this one here is migratory parasite living on the outside and the inside. So there's a group here called the stem and bulb nematode that we're going to talk about specifically on the prairies that goes into plant tissues. Often it's uh, onion bulbs, garlic bulbs but then also the stems of plants as well, okay? And then we have uh, over here, the lesion nematode that we're gonna talk about, where uh, the uh, nematode will penetrate the roots, grow within the roots, move around the roots, cause damage and cause lesions or black uh, areas, spots on the roots that compromise their ability to take up water and nutrients, okay? We're going to talk more about the lesion nematode in the context of the prairies, okay? And then the last one here are referred to as uh, the endoparasites, and these live inside, inside plants, many inside roots, okay? And um, there's the root knot nematodes, and then there are the uh, cyst nematodes, which we are going to specifically talk about in the context of the prairies and particularly with uh, soybean, okay? Okay, let's keep moving on. So here's a little snapshot from a classic textbook on plant pathology of different kinds of plant nematodes. And you can see they range from anything from a quarter of a millimeter in length to uh, all the way up to probably about 10 um, millimeters, almost a centimeter in length in terms of this longudorus here, but very thin. And you can see the vast majority of different types are look like a worm, okay? But on the right side, we have a different uh, group. We have uh, these larger round nematodes and what you're seeing here are the female. The female would start off as a straight nematode like this, but then as she's feeding in a root, she swells. Now, why does she swell? She swells because she gets packed full of eggs, okay? And some of the eggs will stay inside her or and also she'll eject some outside as well into the soil. But this is her head here, that's her head there. And this would be in the root feeding 
and then uh, and the exterior of the root would be here, let's say, and that's where the eggs would be coming out of, okay? So that's pretty neat. Uh, these are the endoparasitic nematodes. This is the cyst nematodes, okay, down here, um, which would be similar to the soybean cyst nematode or potato cyst nematodes. And then particularly uh, here is the root knot nematodes, uh, endoparasitic nematodes here, okay? So it's really fascinating. They're really beautiful to see underneath microscopes. The, um, the diversity of the morphology is, is pretty, pretty beautiful, um, but they also have diversity in terms of how they affect plants, okay? So how do nematodes cause us problems, okay, for growing crops? So one of the things that they do is they siphon the root and stem contents, okay? and they, in effect, are robbing the plant of its energy that is produced through photosynthesis, okay? This will result in, in a compromise in root function, and that's particularly water and nutrient uptake, okay? Nutrients, talking about nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and so forth. So, you can see, this, this you know, nutrient uptake and water uptake, you know, what more, can you ask of a root to do? That's just one of its main purposes, right? And the nematodes will compromise that. The other thing is what they'll do is they'll take energy from the root because they're feeding on the root. And that will just lower the vigor of the root to grow, to explore the soil, to get deeper, increase its density so they can extract water and nutrients, okay? so. The, the root systems become a lot less rigorous as well, right? okay, or vigorous is more what I'm trying to say. Now, the other thing that nematodes do is that they can damage the root physically by making holes in it to enter, uh, or by feeding, leaving residual holes, and other pathogens can then enter the root, like bacteria and fungal pathogens, and then cause a disease. And I'm referring to that as a secondary pathogens as a result of nematode feeding. The other thing that nematodes can do, because they're robbing the plant of energy, water uptake's not that great, nutrient uptake is not that great, the crop plants can be weakened. And then they're, those plants are unable to mount a defense against other pathogens that are attacking, okay? So think of it as a nematode weakening the plant, then a weakened plant then is susceptible to other diseases, okay? And this is an interesting point down here that a lot of people don't um, recognize or are aware of on the prairies, and that is nematodes can be a vector. In other words, they harbor plant viruses within them. So as a nematode would feed on a crop plant, they can, through what would be kind of the equivalent of saliva, uh, they add saliva to the plant and within that saliva would be virus particles and so they can uh, infect the plant. So something like tobacco rattle virus or corky ring spot of potato would be vectored by um, uh, viruses, okay, that are harbored within certain type of nematodes, okay? So it's pretty, pretty interesting. Now, the symptoms of nematode plant diseases are extremely challenging, and this is the major problem we have with nematodes anywhere in the world, and that is it's hard to pinpoint and say, oh, that's a nematode issue often. We often overlook the problem and don't recognize it as a nematode problem immediately, okay? And that's because the symptoms are pretty ambiguous. Dwarfing and stunting of a crop would result in delayed canopy closure of that plant. Sometimes it can be chlorosis or yellowing of the plant because the plant is actually starved for um, nitrogen. It can have galls or these swellings and on roots that can be mistaken for other issues with insect damage, for example. Root rots, 
that secondary pathogens coming in because of the nematode feeding and we think it's a root rot issue but actually it was the nematode that caused the problem to begin with. Lesion on roots, similar, thinking that it was uh, fungal or bacterial pathogens but really it's a nematode causing that. And other uh, symptoms being lack of uh, fine roots, root hairs because of the nematode feeding damage. And sometimes there's stem swelling, stem twisting, which can be uh, thought of sometimes even as um, herbicide uh, damage. And um, so we, we have a, a major problem in being able to recognize nematode damage, okay? So hopefully with this webinar and, and uh, other activities, we, ho we hope to plan in the future that we'll be able to get uh, more information out there on how to spot nematode issues, okay? Now, why are we really talking here today? One of the big major issues with nematodes is that they can be severely, severely problematic for us on farms, okay? And one of the reasons is because a lot of nematodes are what is referred to as being quarantinable. That means that if they're present on a field, it can be problematic to ship and to sell um, so, you know, anything that would have potential for soil um, uh, res residue um, or contamination, either be with the grain or with root tuber crops. Um, and then, um, so it's either um, being shipped out of Canada, but it's also to other regions of Canada, okay? And the other thing too then is that in Canada, we do not, we try to keep some of these nematodes that are listed here as well out of Canada. So we um, will be uh, analyzing and sampling plants and soils that come into the country. And that's done by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, CFIA, okay? And here are some quarantinable nematodes that would be very problematic found on fields, okay? And some of these are present in Canada and uh, there's regulations by CFIA, okay? One of them is the cyst nematodes of potato. Uh, thankfully, we don't have any cyst nematodes of potato on the prairies, okay? Uh, but we do have them in, uh, uh, oh, this should be uh, Vancouver Island and Newfoundland, okay, and, and in Quebec. Uh, potato rod nematode is isolated to around Ottawa on onions. Um, there's needle nematode and some hort crops. A lot of these you can see are on hort crops, okay? Um, now this one here, the cinnamon bald nematode, we're gonna talk more about. This is Ditalenchus dipsacae, and it, it is, can be localized in areas of um, Canada, uh, localized to bulb crops of many provinces, okay? And including uh, garlic as in uh, the northeast of North America, including Ontario and um, Quebec, okay? And we're gonna talk more about that one. And this is actually, we're talking about it now. Here, there we go. The story of the stem and bald nematode and yellow pea. Okay, so this is uh, our first, well, our second foray into nematodes on the prairies, okay? We started this, um, uh, almost a decade ago, okay, with support from the Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba pulse growers. And really, this is a, well, let me get into the story. So this is about Ditalenchus dipsacae, okay? This is our main character, okay? And this is the nematode here drawn. Here is a nematode, these little things here, these little lines, you see those there? That's the nematode under a dissecting microscope. It's only a few millimeters in length, okay? And here is the head area of the nematode, and you can see this little, uh, this darkening spot here, and if you use your imagination or just trust me, there's a spear inside this head, and the nematode pushes this spear out so this black thing here, we call it knobs actually, that would get pushed all the way up to the tip here and then spear would come out. And that's what it uses to poke into plants and then 
siphon and suck out um, the plant contents of xylem, phloem, and, and cells, okay? It's a quarantinable, migratory endal, parasitic nematodes who can live inside and on the surface of plants. And it um, parasitizes many plant species, okay? And there's been a lot of change with this nematode recently in terms of giving it new names scientifically, okay? And a lot of confusion about identifying it. And this is really where our story gets interesting, okay? Uh, the issue was this, with field peas, particularly field peas exported to India from Canada, okay? We uh, exported a lot of peas to India and India had imposed a strict importation restriction on quarantine pests, and it still does, actually. And one of those pests was Dytolinchus dipsacae, okay? And so export uh, uh, vessels, bulk container vessels of field pea from Canada, be shipped to India, but along the way, CFIA would analyze those shipments for the presence of this nematode and other pests, okay? They're just looking to so that by the time it got to India, they declare that it would be free of the pests that India wanted to keep out, or at least say, saying they wanted to keep out. And, but CFA did find a very low occurrence of this nematode in samples, extremely low. Less than 1% of samples had what they thought was this Ditalancus dipsacae quarantinable. Well, that caused problems, big problems, because these vessels needed to be rerouted on the way to India and the Pacific Ocean and um, fumigated. So the gas would be put into the, sh the ship's hold and it would be actually methyl bromide. And that would then, uh, in effect, kill any pests or nematodes present in the, in the hold, okay? Then the ship can go on to port in India and sell the contents, but you can imagine that created havoc. You know, there's a lot of money to, to fumigate and then the delay. So it's it pretty much a headache for a slow frequency of samples here. This is where we got into the picture here at the University of Manitoba looking at this. Was, you know, I kind of said, wow, that's a low frequency, you know? It seems kind of weird if the nematode really liked P uh, it should be a high, higher frequency of being found. So that's where we, we jumped in and tried to look at this. And um, we did a few things. Uh, we uh, did a grower pea grain survey. Maybe some of you were involved with that, where uh, farmers across the prairies shipped us their, their uh, yellow pea, and we had some green pea, dry green peas, uh, shipped to us from uh, directly from their... Um, grain stores or um, just at harvest. And then we followed up with a field weed survey where we actually went out and um, looked at weeds and see if the weeds were on, uh, weeds had the nematode. We did uh, laboratory studies to find out what this nematode liked to feed on, that see if I was finding. And then we even followed up with uh, soil surveys on farmer commercial fields across the prairies, okay? This is what we found with the grain survey. We had a little whack of samples coming in, which is fantastic, great support from farmers across the prairies, okay? And we did find this nematode that CFIA had found in low to pretty high concentrations, okay? Uh, but it was only uh, 10 fields, and these are the version of the 10 fields that we found, and it didn't make any rhyme or reason as to where they weren't isolated to the black zone or, brown or light brown. There was nothing that was connecting them. Um, so we just, I kind of concluded that it was just generally within the pea growing area uh, that uh, this nematode was, was being found, okay? So we were, uh, I was hoping that it would be something in the rotation or something about the soils or the climate, but it didn't seem to be, to be the case, okay? But my students did notice something. When they had thistle heads in the grain samples from farmers, they found the nematode. There's a nematode, there's another nematode, there's another one, there's another one. And they would emanate, as soon as we would put the thistle, here's a thistle head there, there's a portion of a thistle flower head here. 
As soon as that went into water, after a few minutes, live nematodes would start coming out of the thistle head. That's where we said, oh my goodness, and it was the nematode that CFA was finding in the pea grain sample. That's where we said, ah, maybe it's not the peas, but rather it's the thistle that is the, the actual plant that this nematode is feeding on. Okay, and there it is. We can isolate and clean up the extractions from the thistles and we can see very clean samples of the nematode. We can get lots, tons of the nematode coming from these flower parts of thistle. And the thistle turned out to be creeping thistle, or in other words, uh, also known as Canada thistle. I, we like to call it creeping thistle because it's not just in Canada it's found. It actually doesn't even belong in Canada. It's not native to Canada. So we call it creeping thistle. And uh, the, this nematode seems to be on that. And basically the samples uh, where uh, we were finding the nematode in pea grain was because there was also thistle flower heads in the pea grain, okay? And uh, those that have grown field pea are probably not surprised across the prairies. Here's a field pea uh, uh, field um, that's just about um, ready to harvest. And what do we see? We, all this green stuff is creeping thistle, okay? So uh, this is a field in Saskatchewan. And um, we followed up with a survey across the prairies and found that um, this Ditalenchus nematode was present wherever there was creeping thistle, basically, okay? Um, particularly in Manitoba and Alberta, we found a lot of it uh, on thistle. And even now, that's how we, if we want this nematode, we just go and find uh, uh, creeping thistle in road ditches, and it will be there. And this is what it does to creeping thistle. Here's a stem piece that's twisted and swollen, and you can see it damages even the, the leaves. Uh, we, we have um, browning and dying of the leaves. You have lesions on the stems here, this or there. And we can even stain the stem, and here's the nematode in the stem. So these little pink things here is actually the nematode living within the stem of the creeping thistle, okay? So it seems to really love uh, creeping thistle. And then when we looked at the nematode, this is the nematode that came out of the thistle. There's three of them here. And this is the one that CFA thought we had. And when I looked at these nematodes and compared it to those ones, I said, hmm, something's wrong here. They don't look the same. Hmm? Much narrower. See that? Then uh, this one here, though, this one is quarantinable. The, the fatter one, the thicker one is quarantinable. And this one here, we wanted to figure out, well, what is this? Uh, you know, I suspected it was a different species of um, Ditalenchus nematode, okay? And we did a whole bunch of work. Uh, you know, well, actually, my people did the work, the students and postdocs, of course. And, but we confirmed that the nematode was actually a new kind of nematode. It was recently named called Ditalenchus wisheri. It was not the quarantinable nematode based on its genetics. Okay. So that was very interesting. And, we, and with the support of the Paul scorers, we developed a whole bunch of diagnostic um, procedures looking at the DNA of the nematode to be able to identify it uh, quickly. Okay. And we passed on all the information that we had to CFIA um, about analysis of the nematode and then um, um, that it was different species. And then they, CFIA then redid analyses with the new methods, and then they themselves declared that yes, what what was called the quarantinable nematode was actually not. It was this wisher eye. Okay, so that was a great win for us because we um, there was no reason to actually fumigate those um, uh, vessels, of sh those ships for this nematode. Okay, because the this wisher eye this nematode that we found in the prairies with creeping thistle is not a uh, quarantinable nematode, okay? Actually, there was no evidence at all that it was 
harmful to, to peas, but you always have to test things, right? We're scientists and that's what we do is check things out. And so a PhD student, Abel Fazel, looked at, um, took this nematode and asked, what does it like to feed on? So we took major crops on the prairies and uh, these, are, these were um, some um, dominant uh, varieties grown. Okay, we, we had spring wheat and canola. We used garlic as, because garlic, um, the stem and bulb nematode, the quarantinable one, supposedly likes garlic. Um, and uh, we used creeping thistle as well, and chickpea, a couple chickpea varieties, lentil, um, some field pea varieties, and dry bean varieties, okay? So the bigger the bar, the bigger the bar, and particularly when the bar is above this one line here, that means the nematode grew, or sorry, it reproduced and its numbers increased. In this case, almost about five and a half times from the beginning, at the start of the experiment. This is growing these plants in the greenhouse, okay? So it's clear, this one stands out, right? Which, which one of these things is different? Well, it's the creeping thistle. And it really loves creeping thistle this new nematode that we found, okay? When we look at the other crops, wheat, canola doesn't like, garlic doesn't like, doesn't like chickpea, doesn't like lentil, doesn't like dry beans. Peas, field peas, I wouldn't say it likes it, it just kind of hangs out. It doesn't really grow in terms of reproduce uh, or expand its numbers, but just kind of, I would say, survives, okay? So just about survives. So uh, maybe, maybe in the field it might uh, be able to survive on field pea, but definitely does not thrive on it. Okay, in other words, not reproducing on it, feeding on it, reproducing, and if, if it was reproducing and doing all that feeding, that would cause damage. Okay, it really likes creeping thistle. Okay, then we did the same thing. Abel Falls did the same thing with um, the quarantinable nematode. Okay, and as you, here it is, same crops down here in varieties, and that nematode really loves garlic by the high number here, over six times it uh, increases population, and it really likes peas, okay? But luckily, we did not find this nematode on peas, okay? So, um, if it was present on peas, it would be an issue, but it isn't, so that's that's a good thing, okay? But really, it's a major issue or likes to thrive on, on garlic, and it is thriving in eastern Canada and northeastern United States, okay? Uh, as well, interesting, the this quarantinable nematode does like to grow, reproduce on field beans, okay? So um, it is a nematode that will, would be problematic if we did have it on the prairies, but like I say, we don't have it, okay? So, uh, but nevertheless, we did compare the two species and they are quite different in their hosts, okay? Whereas the one that we found on the creeping thistle is not a, what we refer to as a parasite that causes damage problems to um, peas or other uh, pulse crops, okay? Abel also did a field study here uh, in Winnipeg with um, growing yellow pea with that nematode um, found on creeping thistle, and we also found that it did not cause a problem for the field pea, okay? So, so that was pretty good news for us, okay? But hang on, it's always something to be careful about, and this is what we have to be careful with, and that is it does love garlic and garlic is affected by the nematode and it is rampant in Eastern Canada. So we had, uh, had a farmer, local farmer south of Winnipeg visited me and he brought this bag with him of mushy, really stinky, rotted garlic. And he said, well, my whole crop is destroyed. He goes, King, you know what the problem is. I looked at the garlic and it was just chock full of these nematodes. And there you can see a nematode there. We used the stain to stain the nematodes pink. And it turns out that in this 
garlic was chock full of the quarantinable nematode, okay? So the nematode can be present on the prairies, particularly in garlic. Now, I asked, tried to poke around and saying, hey, where have you had this problem before? He said, no, never had this problem before. And I said, well, okay, tell me more about this field. Well, it turns out he had bought garlic bulbs from Ontario in the fall of 2014, planted them, and in the following year, in 2015, he had a problem with the garlic just being completely destroyed. He didn't, he didn't harvest one bulb, okay? He didn't harvest one bulb in 2015 because of the nematode issue. It turns out, in effect, what ended up happening was he bought infested garlic seed from Ontario, planted it, and the ne he planted the nematode into his field and it decimated his crop. So I suggested to him to not put garlic or onions in that field at all, okay? So you go to something else that's a non-host, okay? But I think here we need this really, to me, open my eyes and say, whoa, we need to get the word out to pulse growers and to say, hey, um, and also to garlic growers that be careful we don't really want to mix garlic with our other crops, particularly pulse crops, uh, for the fear of transferring this nematode to our pulse crops. Okay, so I think this is really important with our project with uh, the pulse growers. We like to get do some workshops and get out to growers and also to garlic growers and talking about the importance of making sure that their fields are not infested with this nematode, okay? All right, any questions there? Um, Andrea, have we had any questions on this topic? Sorry, I had to unmute myself here. Yeah, there's a few questions. Um, going back to the beginning of your presentation, um, let's see, uh, gosh, goodness gracious me. Let's go to genetically male or female, or does it occur due to environmental conditions? I think that was about nematodes. Oh, very good, excellent. So generally what happens if times are good for the nematode in terms of lots of plentiful food and temperature and moisture and so forth like that, and the food being presence of a host, then they really just wanna really reproduce their um, population really fast so they'd have lots of females. And if um, things become stressful, lacking food and, and, and um, uh, change in dry conditions or things like that, then uh, you can, sometimes we can find more males. And then it's because the population is trying to increase its genetic diversity and we, we get more males and um, we um, then uh, can they become higher proportion of the population. So that's an excellent question. But it, usually it's hardwired that you're always gonna have more females than males. The males can increase in, in proportion um, under adverse conditions though. Great, okay. Um, another question, would it be right to assume that based on your symptoms chart, the damage would be seen more in localized or in general crop symptoms? Okay, I'm not sure what localized or general crops um, is. The symptoms tend to show up under um, sand soils or coarse textured soils because they have less water holding capacity and available moisture. And so stressed roots then because of the nematode will then not be able to transfer water over as well. So that's one thing where we see the damage occurring more often. And then secondly, we see the damage um, uh, occurring in tight rotations where we are growing higher uh, um, frequency of a particular um, type of host, okay? okay. And um, there was one other point that I was gonna mention about where we see it more, oh, in dry years. So years with not much water. Okay. Now, it, we tend to see more nematode issues under horticulture crops than field crops, but that's what we're gonna be talking about next in terms of soybean cyst nematode. Okay, 
Um, there's a question about other species of, of thistle. Um, has this shown up at all in south thistle or spiny annuals? That's a great question. So we have seen the nematode on other thistles, but not to the same extent. It really does like the creeping thistle or Canada thistle the most. Okay. Um, a question is wild garlic a host then for this nematode? Oh, I don't know. I didn't, I, I do not know. That's a great question. <laughs> uh, one more and then I'll let you continue on with your presentation. Uh, how long can the nematodes survive in the soil without a host? For example, garlic. Okay, so nematodes actually they're geared to survive in soil without a host. So they, they, these nematodes uh, in general will be able to survive several years without a host. Well, oftentimes what happens is there'll be a weed or something like that or weed species that they can use to survive on if they don't uh, prefer the, the crops that are being grown as a host. Uh, so that can just keep the population surviving, uh, but even without any feeding, they are geared to just rest, lie dormant, handle winter, handle dry conditions, and last for several years. Now it becomes problematic with these nematodes we're talking about now, the cyst nematodes, we're talking many years, if not a decade, um, that they can survive. Wow. Okay. Well, I'll let you continue on with your presentation. Okay, so we're, let's move to soybean cyst nematode. Work that we've um, been uh, uh, doing within Manitoba because uh, soybean is such a, uh, a major crop in Manitoba. And um, so this is what we're dealing with, soybean cyst nematode. Here's cyst nematodes. Those are nematodes, these white things here. Those are females. They're small, they're the size of a pinhead on fine roots. This is a nodule that fixes nitrogen. It's a different beast entirely. You can see it's really large. So you can't really confuse the two. It's not like it produces a big alpha. There's this little white thing here. Eventually this will turn brown, almost black, as the female cyst matures. So this is the issue here. So what you see in red is the spread of the soybean cyst nematode throughout North America and Ontario and then even into Quebec. So for the prairies, uh, pardon, pardon me Saskatchewan and Alberta for not including you on the map there, but you can see where Manitoba is and it's moving right up the Red River Valley along the border there between North Dakota and Minnesota. Okay, now this is what we wanted to figure out and this is what we've been working with uh, the pulse growers in terms of doing surveys within Manitoba because we had a, a recent history of soybean growth where of growing soybean on commercial fields for three, four, five uh, years now in terms of um, having a, a number of times soybean would be grown on the field. So it's about the right time for potentially for the nematode to have been established and to ramp up its population. You can see this march northward here. It started in 1954 and it spread. Basically it spread with the soybean acreage in North America. So we suspected that for sure it would be found in Manitoba eventually. We just didn't know when and we wanted to find out when and where so that we can get out and talk to you about um, protecting your fields, okay, and keeping the nematode down in population. So as of 2017, this is the, the currents and counties in the United States and in Ontario, and you can really see how the nematode crossed over um, from the U.S. into Quebec, and then also crossed over uh, from uh, Michigan into uh, southwestern Ontario. So we really thought that it would be moving northward, um, because you can see it's at the borders with um, Manitoba and uh, North Dakota and Minnesota. And that's what we did. Now, the problem with soybean cyst nematode from a disease standpoint and visual symptoms is that it can be confused with drown outs and iron chlorosis. You can see here, this is in Ontario with uh, severe, uh, well, not severe, but SCM damage. And you can see the canopy is not closing, it's stunted and so forth. And you could think that this maybe was a low spot uh, or there's an iron chlorosis issue or water logging. Okay, so it can be very confusing. So we need to get out there and uh, survey soil for and try to ex 
look at soil and see if the cysts are present to find out if it's established in Manitoba. Okay, so what does SCM does? Well, a lot of things that uh, we already talked about. Takes away nutrients or can't take up nutrients. Takes uh, the vigor away from plants. Water uptake is uh, affected. Interferes with nodulation because the roots aren't as vigorous to feed the bacteria. Damages roots so we can get secondary infections that we'll talk about in a moment. And what are the field symptoms? Well, yellowing of plants, resembling iron corrosive, stunted plants and even height, early maturity, um, and then reduced yield, fewer pods per plant, damage shows earlier on sandy soils or light textured soils than um, uh, clay soils, okay? So back in 2015, we did a survey of 22 fields in Manitoba. It was, they were negative for soybean cyst nematode. Uh, we repeated that again, oh, this should have been 2017, uh, 28 fields, it was negative again. Then we um, conducted another survey of 30 commercial, another 30 commercial soybean fields that we sampled in 2018. Now, uh, these fields did yield uh, some nematode cysts, but they may not all be uh, soybean cyst nematode or, if, or not even cyst so it's a nematode at all, okay? Um, however, we took every cyst that was possible that was intact and had eggs inside it, we um, analyzed it, okay? We analyzed it for if it was SCN or not, by the morphology of, of the cyst, and then also looking at its molecular DNA. So we did kind of like a CSI, type of DNA analysis to find out if it was actually soybean cyst nematode. And we found out actually that there were four fields. Uh, one, two, four, 14 cysts per five pounds of soils. Very low levels, but we had four fields. One commercial field, one in Ruminous Palladia Gray, Montcan, Montcalm, um, and uh, oh, I can't see let me, Rhineland, and then Norfolk, Treehern, okay? So we had four um, positive finds for SCN, okay? And what do we do here? This is my student, Nazanin, extracting the soil with a cyst extractor, uh, looking at the cysts, uh, and then doing the molecular analysis to prove that they were SCN. And then she actually found the nematode, there it is there, on a root of a, um, soybean in one of those fields, in particular one in Norfolk Treehern, this summer because it was growing soybean. So we confirmed the presence of the nematode. Now we've got that soil from Norfolk Treehern in the laboratory here and we're trying to raise the population of the nematode so we can do more studies on it, okay? But this is a take home message that we found in that uh, in gray is, are all the municipal municipalities that we sampled commercial fields from, okay? We really focus along the Red River and extending out of it, because that's the largest history, longest history of soybean. And we also thought that the nematode would be coming up from the south, where it is in the U.S., particularly because of the water from the Red River and flooding and so forth. And, um, or, or maybe wind and so forth. And that's what we did see. That's where Mont Cam, Emerson, Franklin, Rhineland, uh, and then um, we have the Norfolk Treehern up here. And um, this one stands out. It doesn't follow the pattern of expected in terms of coming up via the, the river. And what we're, so something happened here that's different. So I think likely maybe machinery was purchased or something in terms of was contaminated with soil from the U.S. and brought onto this farm. And with that soil was brought uh, soybean cyst nematode, and that's how I was able to establish here, okay? It's because it's next to the Cinnaboyne River, and the, I don't think there'd be much connection in terms of bringing cysts via the, the Cinnaboyne, okay? So we're gonna hopefully, with the, with the cooperation of the pulse growers and uh, province of Manitoba, continue these surveys in the future, because now we have establishment of where the nematode is. Now these are very, very low population. And because we've been trying to hunt for the nematode, we've, we've found it when it's in really low population. But that's great because now we, we found it when it's just started and we can talk about uh, protecting you against it 
building up and, and causing more problem. Now, why is this a big issue? Not only because the soybean can be effective in reducing yields on its own, sorry, soybean cyst nematode, but also because soybean cyst nematode is closely associated with sudden death syndrome of soybean caused by a fusarium. And that's, that's an issue that is a double whammy, not only just nematode, but also because of the fusarium. And it really comes in because of the nematode damage. So we really need to keep an eye on this and we gotta be really vigilant to, to keep the populations down. How are we gonna do that? Prevent soil movement between fields, particularly soil coming from the, the US or any fields now in Manitoba, commercial fields for um, soybean. Okay, clean your footwear, uh, um, wash, blast soil off of field equipment, okay? Keep trucks and vehicles off fields, okay? You can try killing birds. Birds are a great way of moving the nematode around again onto feet and feathers and stuff like that, okay? I don't really advocate just shooting birds for the sake of shooting birds, okay? It's more for fun. Um, you can include resistant soybean varieties in your rotation. Here's examples from Ontario where this, these are resistant soybean varieties here, and here's non-resistant varieties that really show up. You can see the nematode is just hammering those non-resistant uh, varieties, okay? So we do have some resistant varieties to SEN, um, so you may think about including that in your rotations. You don't have to do it every time you grow soybean, but if you mix it in, it keep the populations down. Uh, sample your fields, uh, scout your fields, you can do that yourself, okay? You don't need to pay big bucks to do that. You just uh, dig up the plants gently, lift them out of the soil, and then uh, look at the, the roots if you see whitish type uh, cysts. That can be an indication if you pinch those cysts with your fingernails and they pop kind of like a zit and ooze out a white liquid, that can be a real indicator of the nematode present. Okay, and uh, there you see the nematode there. There's those nodules again, quite different, okay. So um, if you're in a clay soil like we have in the, in the valley, uh, you may want to soak the roots first so that way the clay can disperse off the root and then look at it. If you rip the plants out of the soil, they might just strip off the nematode, the female cysts right off the roots because of the soils being so hard, okay. But I do urge you to do that, okay. So how are we doing, Andrea? Are we um, getting close to uh, um, a deadline here? You're you're getting close. Uh, do you have much left to go? Um, I have. A, I I can. Can I take two, three minutes? You bet. You sure can. Okay. All right. Well, how about other nematodes of pulse crops on the prairies? Okay. So with the pulse growers, we've been conducting surveys of pulse fields. Okay, a pea, lentil, chickpea, faba, across Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario, looking for that ditalenchus, that stem involved nematode, but then also trying to uh, see if there are any other issues of different nematodes out there. Okay, so we've sampled um, uh, many fields and of sampled the crops in terms of finding nematodes on them or what nematodes are on them, and then also weeds in those fields as well. And one nematode that pops up as being fairly prevalent, here's an example, Pratolanchus, okay, present in 19% of all commercial fields that we sampled, okay, and here are the spots here in um, red being positive fields, and um, we uh, wanted to find out what is this nematode? So Pratolanchus is called a root lesion nematode, okay? And so we wanted to dive into that. And um, a student, Fernanda, who uh, has done that, and here's example, yellow pea, chickpea, and lentil, where she's finding populations of the root lesion nematode uh, to be higher in their yellow pea, for example, here, and um, quite a few positive samples from the Ontario, sorry, from Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta, and even present on some weeds as well, okay? So um, we wanted to uh, dive into this a bit further, 
She dived into it using molecular analysis. Here's the critter here. There's a nematode there, lovely little beast. There's this needle that it uses to stab and, and um, feed on plants. She did a bunch of molecular DNA type work and found out actually that the nematode is P. neglectus. So it's a really a nematode that, of the species neglectus. Okay, that's the species that we have on the prairies. Okay, it's not a really a nematode that we would find uh, predominantly, let's say, in eastern Canada. Okay, so it's it's a different species. So that's kind of interesting uh, because there's not as much known about this particular nematode. Okay, we did work in the past on potato. And because we did find this nematode in some potato fields in Manitoba, and I had a student, uh, Amro Meran, did his PhD, and he could not find that this nematode that was on the prairies was damaging potato. Okay, so that was that was good. Okay, but there have been reports of yield reductions of this nematode in, in uh, peas and lentils in the Pacific Northwest. Okay, so in Washington, Idaho, Oregon. Okay. And in Australia, it's been known as a pest of canola and wheat. So I had a student, uh, Prisilar, uh, under the project to examine this in more detail to find out, is it a problem on the prairies? So Prisilar, this is just one example of a study that she's uh, recently completed, where she grew canola, chickpea, lentil, pinto beans, soybean, wheat, yellow pea, and uh, control with no plant. And looking at how the nematode reproduced, if, it, if it's these bars are above one, then it reproduced and increased its population numbers. If the bars are below one, that means the nematode in effect was dying and did not reproduce, okay? So what do we find here? Well, there's really only three crops, canola, chickpea, and soybean that this nematode, this lesion nematode on the uh, prairies uh, seem to be able to reproduce on, and particularly it seem to, seems to like soybean much more than chickpea or canola. She then also then uh, did the experiment where she grew over time, th well, three different cycles of each of those crops in pots in the greenhouse and looked for the population ramping up. And this blue line here really tells you the picture that uh, this nematode really loves soybean. There it goes there. So after the first cycle, it, it doubled and it doubled again and so forth. After the third cycle of growing soybean, we only grew the soybean for six weeks in the pots and then cut them, then replanted soybean into it. Chickpea and um, pinto bean kind of survived a little bit um, there and, and canola as well. So, you know, but not to the same extent that it really thrived on soybean, okay? So this is very fascinating. It's the first indication that this Pratolinchus neglectus is um, interested in soybean and actually can thrive on it quite a bit. So we now, um, and here it is in soybean uh, root tissue and also some chickpea as well. And you can see the nematode here in pink, pretty cool, stained, but it's inside the tissue of the roots. It's um, it's an endomigratory nematode, so it likes to be inside the root and then would like to reproduce outside the root. So it can cause this damage and um, as we say, it really likes uh, soybean. So I throw this out because we have to be careful of this now um, because we are continuing with underneath the, the, under the science cluster, pulse science cluster project with colleagues in Alberta with Sam Chatterton uh, at Lethbridge, at Canada and Lethbridge, of doing a field study with this nematode and growing soybean to see how well it reproduces in the field. Okay, there seems to be a hot spot in the, the Tabor Lethbridge area for the nematode. Uh, this nematode, so we're um, using the soil naturally present with the nematode. In, in our studies on soybean there in the field. And we're continuing our studies here in the laboratory um, with the nematode and various crop plants. So I throw this out because I think this is an emerging issue with this religion nematode and soybean um, as we grow more soybean or continue to grow soybean um, that we need to be paying attention. So 
bottom line is I'm, I'm wrapping up here. Hopefully we might have a chance to take a question or two if Andrea lets us. I haven't talked about the potato cyst nematode, the sugar beet cyst nematode, um, which are issues for the prairies. Not that uh, the, we don't have the potato cyst nematode. We do have the sugar beet cyst nematode, particularly in, in Alberta where they're still growing sugar beets, but that's being controlled by rotation. One in four years of, of growing sugar beet uh, is mandated by the sugar company, and, and uh, that seems to hold the population at bay, which is great. Cereal cyst nematodes aren't an issue at the moment, but they are an emerging nematode problem in the Pacific Northwest on a cereals, so particularly wheat and oats. So this is something that I think we need to pay attention to in Manitoba, particularly in, in Alberta, which is closer to the Pacific Northwest. And then there's an issue with a stubby root nematode of corn, which is an uh, ectoparasitic nematode of corn, but it can harbor a, a virus in it. And as it feeds, it can transfer the virus to crop plants. It doesn't affect corn, the virus, but it does affect potato and produces corky ring spot virus, or tobacco rattle virus of potato. So I have seen that on occasion in the, the prairies, and it is a problem for, for potato and isolated conditions. So particularly where corn and potato, which in Manitoba can be fairly common, um, is an issue. I tell my growers to try to avoid uh, corn if possible growing uh, potato. So lots of people to thank, uh, particularly like to thank uh, the pulse growers of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and the Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers, uh, Agriculture Agri-Food Canada for the funding, Western Grains Research Foundation as well. And lots of collaborators, uh, lots of students that have been involved with this, not just uh, uh, single or even just a few people um, targeting this. So we're going to remain vigilant on the prairies with nematodes and hopefully uh, be able to continue with some programming to uh, get uh, you more informed and acknowledged about and aware of nematodes. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. If we have time, Andrea, I'm available to answer questions. Yep, sure. I've got a few here. Um, the first one is, are there any known parasites or natural enemies to nematodes? Absolutely. Yes, so there are many uh, natural uh, parasites and enemies of plant parasitic nematodes. So generally, as you increase the, the amount or density or uh, population of the plant parasitic nematodes, then over time, over a number of years, then there's a selected pressure for um, things that will eat or feed off of or kill those um, um, parasitic nematodes to increase in their population. So yes, now unfortunately those not, not really anything that's gonna kill them completely in a field. They may reduce the population a bit, but they're not gonna knock them out to get you to the point where there's no problem whatsoever. So, um, but they are helpful. Yes, so part of soil health and building soil health, organic matter in soil, be to encourage the presence of these beneficial organisms to, to help control the population. Won't knock them out, but help it helps. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the next question kind of can go in a couple of parts, but are seed treatments effective against nematodes? And at what growth stage is the plant most vulnerable to infection? Excellent question. Most vulnerable early on. Okay, so we're really talking at the seedling stage. Uh, because uh, then um, that early loss in vigor, vigor of the root system it then causes we, um, um, clo uh, lack of closure of the canopy, and then we can have weed issues, and then um, the weeds can come in. The weeds can be host as well for the nematode or other nematodes, so then it's, it's early on, which is problematic. Seed treatments, that's a big, big research area and topic, and that's a big area where the um, plant protection companies are putting a lot of emphasis into at the moment. And we are seeing products come onto the market for field crops and hoard crops that are nematicides that would be seed treatments, that uh, some of them are um, systemics mm -hmm. that can help protect the, the whole root system, not just by the, at the seed. And then also they um, 
can activate. So not only just being a nematocyte, but they can be activators where they um, basically uh, not kind of inoculate, but prime the let's say prime the crop plant to mount a defense against nematodes. Okay. okay? So in other words, it kind of fakes out the plant to say, hey, I got a nematode problem. I'm going to protect myself. Okay. And as it grows, so that's another um, avenue there. So yeah, you're going to see, and there are products out there. Um, being sold for soybean, but then also for potatoes as well, and some pork crops, okay, um, for uh, seed treatments uh, or in furrow application treatments, okay, yeah. Okay, excellent, thank you. Another question asks, uh, where can one get tests done for soil or roots for nematodes? Are commercial labs set up to analyze any of this? That is a beautiful question. Uh, I wish I could give you lots of information on that, that would be um, excellent. <laughs> um, it's a tough issue, okay, uh, to find commercial laboratories that can get good analyses done, or reliable analyses. So in, the, in my research laboratory, we, we, we take a, a lot of time and care in, in doing analyses, and um, um, it's really tough to translate over to the commercial setting to do that. Um, so at the moment, uh, there are some labs in the United States. Uh, there's Agvise that can do potato nematodes. There's ANL laboratory in um, London, Ontario that can do uh, nematodes and soil. I'm working with a group called ACS uh, Laboratory in New Brunswick, which is supported by the potato growers of New Brunswick. And we've been working with them to get our methods out there for analysis. Now, um, uh, at the moment, uh, the analyses have been done primarily by looking and counting and visualizing the nematode, and that can cause errors. So I've seen many farmers come to me and say, hey, I, um, this report of nematode analysis tells me that I have a root lesion problem or I have a root knot problem or I have potato cyst nematode in my field. And I'm, well, no, no, they don't say that, but um, these other nematodes, and I say, oh, are you sure? I'm not sure about that. And I'll look at their soil, and, I, and it's like, no, you don't. That's it's a misidentification, okay? So the application of the molecular DNA tools, I'm hoping will uh, uh, lessen that issue of the misdiagnosis or uh, identification of the nematode. So it's problematic. So. You know, what I would say is um, growers uh, in Manitoba uh, with soybean, I think they may have an issue, or if you see um, a soybean cyst nematode on your roots, I think send me an email, tag me uh, in Twitter, and talk to me, and then we'll see what we can do. And I'm, I'm actually open to, to talking with anybody, uh, any growers uh, or industry that uh, has nematode concerns, just talk to me, email me, and uh, we can see um, how we can um, um, help you out. If it's uh, work that related with work that we're doing, um, maybe it can be part of our research, or I can provide advice as to where I would have confidence that you can send those samples in. Okay, thanks. We have a few more questions, but we're short on time. So would you mind if I sent you those questions? Could you send them the answers back to me in an email and I can share with the group who's um, posed them? Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for the webinar today. Um, your research is really fascinating and I think that there's a lot of applicability and a lot of takeaways for all of us that attended uh, today. Just a reminder for the participants that an email will be sent out after this webinar. So please respond with your CCA or CCSC number to get your credits. Thank you again to MPSG and APG for helping organize and promote this session. And a big thank you to all of the participants for all of the engagement and the questions today. There were a lot of them. Uh, as I said, a recording of this webinar will be made available to everyone via email and will be distributed on social media and on the websites for Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba. So with that, thank you very much everyone and have a great afternoon. All right, celebrate the bombers. Thanks again. Bye. Bye now.